And welcome back to The Man in Line. With me, Chris Thomas and Daphne Kane, both members of the House of Keys. And I'm Roger Watterson, and we are now looking forward to your telephone calls. I gather we got one or two in the wings, but we got a lot of texts and emails, um, emails here. <clears throat> Roger, you were talking about a walking festival. Are the panel aware that a lot of footpaths on the island are overgrown and not looked after? And there are a lot of landowners who don't like people walking on their land. They remove the signs and make it difficult for the walkers, says John. I said a March theme special year is about getting out more, the great outdoors, and I really hope that footpaths and the maintenance of footpaths can be looked at. We hope to have a special new trail. Um, this could be by volunteers, or it could be by local authorities, it could be by government as it has been in the past. The, uh, your listener makes a very important point. Now, Daphne, I find it sometimes mildly amusing, if not frustrating, <clears throat> that of all the issues that we deal with and all the high and low level things that go through our parliamentary system, you get international spotlight over goats. Mm, apparently, <laughs> yes. yes. Are there any more comments about goats coming in? Yeah, well, there's one or two, but, um. <laughs> but you know, but I, I notice there's a sign about goats on the road as you go out, which is quite like these things be careful, dear. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Well, they, places, they, but They've taken to going on the road. The road was closed for a number of uh, months past Bulgham when they were sorting out the rock face and the goats took to going on there. But since that question was tabled, and you're saying about national issues, mm. but, well, I, I think it is a national issue. I've been handed a copy of the advice issued by the Animal Health Division over many years to commissioners, farmers, landowners, etc. And in it, they state... The simple existence of such a colony is, in the view of the Animal Health Division, a significant disease risk to the neighbouring farms in normal circumstances and a very serious risk to the island as a whole in the current situation. It says they can carry and transmit a number of diseases, both to other people and, and animals. The population cannot be gathered, they cannot be inspected or regularly supervised, they are spreading over an increasing area and they're naturally adept at overcoming practically any obstacle, cannot be restricted to an enclosure. And since the question went out, I've heard from three different um, marksmen who deal with the problem humanely and between them I would estimate that they have accounted for 200 goats over the past 18 months. That means there must be a great deal of them because there's a lot left yet, there's, isn't there? There's plenty left and people <clears throat> have affection for the goats around Bulgum. We don't want to see them completely obliterated. You know, we'd like goats there, but it has to be a managed population. And when, when I read this advice from the Animal Health Division, um, it's, 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 it's quite horrifying in terms of this is the department's accepted wisdom, the goats are suffering... Uh, it says, quite apart from the unnecessary pain and distress caused to the lambs involved um, by they, what they found on a farm, lesions of orf, and that's like pustules that you've on, on um, livestock. It said, living in a feral colony is not synonymous with welfare utopia. In fact, it can be quite the opposite with open sores, chronic foot rot, disease lesions, even broken limbs being untreated. Such events taking place on a farm would immediately attract strident criticism, and rightly so. But it also says that there is um, a risk to road users and I know amongst the contacts I've had from people they are worried that um, a cyclist has been knocked off his bike by a goat cost fortunately was not injured but cost several hundred pounds to repair the bike um, one car is known to have collided with a goat over the past years um, that there is a real fear that what would it what would happen if it was a TT rider mm, but it, as far as they're concerned I, I read somewhere that one was uh, called a very great weighty thing, too, far bigger than the domestic goats, <clears throat> and it was full of ticks. Yeah, the, the, the one that was at Balaric, the particular one, was a 23 stone goat. It took That's four big. people to lift it into a, train, yeah, a trailer, yeah, yeah. and the, the hindquarters were absolutely full of ticks, which must have been driving that poor animal demented. And there, there was no way of treating them, because as, as this advice right. from the DEFA so um, Animal the Health Division says... Did it, but when you say it affects other farm animals, is it like badgers? Is it carry that sort of disease to other creatures? Yes. Yeah, it can. It, well, it's saying about off, um, there's obviously the ticks. But it says the department's concern over these goats has very little to do with the complaints of local farmers. The reasons for restricting or even eliminating such a population are obvious and um, the department has no powers directly to care for these animals. Such powers fall to their owners or being ownerless to the landowner. And it does lie within the power of landowners to destroy such animals by lawful, humane means or to treat them if it were possible, which it generally is not. 
Right. Now, I'll just go to the caller in a moment, but there's one more question come in from Andy. <clears throat> he says, does Mrs. Kane support or um, resist the aim and objectives, this is a wonderful title, of the Garfian Wild Goats Front? I'm not aware of that organisation. <laughs> you have to tell me what its aims and... Uh, oh. As referred to on Facebook, joining forces with the other group, the Wild Goats Front of Garf. <laughs> Right. Yeah, well... I, I, you I must be kidding, hey? <laughs> I've I, I got a feeling that might be a spoof. Do you think? I, I, possibly. <laughs> right, let's let's now um, go to our first call. It's, it's Stephen Good. Hello, good afternoon, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, Roger, and good afternoon, panel. My question is two parts, really, um, and the first part is I heard the uh, Minister of Policy and Reform talking about the only the MHKs voting for the Chief Minister. And one question I have, not specifically for him, but it's, it's of uh, Tim Will Reform. And I, I think that I'm right in saying that there was a number of interlinking parts of the Lisbane recommendations which are essential for the good governance of our island. So I hope that this doesn't just stop at this particular reform we've seen now. And I would like to ask, uh, when will we see the other parts of the reform, such as not everybody being in governance of one type? In other words, people being allowed to do other things within government for the good of the island. And I'll give you the second part now so you can think about it while you're answering the first. And the second is, with the, re with the announced review of Timbles, I'm sure a lot of people out in the island will be concerned that there is no mention of free at the point of need so a lot of us will be concerned is do we have to start saving or will we be turning to a US style insurance scheme and the second of the second part to this second question is uh, how much involvement will the people have in this review will we be able to make our views known and possibly our opposition to uh, removing the free at the point of need. So is is our health system safe with Timwald? Uh, will they protect these points? So anyway, the first part of the first question first, please. Well, so that goes back to whether you're freeing people up to do other things. That's what you say, really, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stephen. How are you? Um, thank you. The, on the 31st of January, there is actually a, a lecture at the Isle of Man College. Um, Dr. I think even a Professor Edge is talking about the future of the Legislative Council, and that would be a great place for you and me and others to debate these issues. At the moment, we are waiting back the Watterson report into the uh, Liz Vane recommendations. The crucial thing about the change to the Chief Minister election process was that wasn't a um, suggestion of Lord Liz Vane. That came from Alfred Cannon's motion, the Treasury Minister's motion, in the last House, and it was... Uh, um, brought forward by my motion, but it's basically it's a, a change that originated in the, in our island for our people by a manxman, brought by a manxman in the in the person of Alfred Cannon. Regarding uh, the health service, um, in the, the current National Health Services Act 2001, the first section in that law says the duty of the department. It lays down the duty of department, and it does include in that that the services provided under this act shall be free of charge. The 2016 act was amended by me um, such that the scheme that needs to be made under that new act needs to come to Tinwood for approval. There's nothing in the act, the 2016 act, that talks about free of charge. So the debate is live, it's for people to get involved, it's for politicians to get involved and we have to specify that first scheme before that first scheme comes to Tim Wood. And one, you've identified one of the crucial issues. The health service has never been completely free. We've always had to pay for some things, but currently there is a suggestion that more things should be charged for and that's on the table and we need to debate it properly. We go back to the beverages cradle to the grave here, don't we? We have and for <coughs> two, the first two years of the health service back in the 40s everything was free apparently but mm. that stopped in 1949. Since then we've had charges for some things, certainly it's on the table that we might have charges for more things. Okay, right, but does that answer your question Stephen? Well, it's uh, it's an answer that uh, that Chris has given. Has Daphne got any comments on the on the points that I've made? Hi, Stephen. Um, I think I'd like to ask the 
Minister for Policy and Reform. Can he give any reassurances over the privatisation of certain aspects of the health service? And that's a really helpful question because there are all sorts of issues that are under review. One of them is charging and whether it's free of charge. A second one is about how the services are delivered and certainly the new Act allows for the department to make arrangements with other people to deliver parts of the service, so that needs to be discussed. A third one is the role of politicians in the process. During 2015 and 16, we seem to be moving towards a board system where we left it to professionals with political oversight to run the health and care service and we seem to be moving back from that but that's another issue on the table massive issues in health and care we need to stand up to them we need to make changes but what the changes will look like is for public determination because that's what politics is all about but having said that <clears throat> you've got an issue that's not going away and it's getting worse so it's 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 not just a case of wish it has to be action doesn't it yeah because we haven't approved as yet contrary to public opinion and actually what max radio reported we haven't approved the public accounts committee report we've just that's on the table and it will be debated again in march but that report is excellent in bringing some facts to the fore and one of those is the amount of money spent on health has been going up and it's also been over budget for 20 years there are well has it been underfunded for 20 years. Exactly. So these are all issues now and this is one of the most important issues. It's not the only very important issue but this group of politicians has massive challenges to face. Our island is great, that's why we're having the special year. It's wonderful that 200 people turned up to Oncom Park to look at the dark skies, but we have to look at public service pensions, the economy, the population, the health, the care system for older people, all sorts of issues. And I can assure you it's a pleasure to work with Daphne and my 23 colleagues in the House of Keys and Legislative Council members, but we've really got our work cut out. I don't think you got all your answer there, Stephen, but you got near to it. What do you think? Anything else before we leave? Yeah, well, the the only the, uh, I was a bit disappointed that Chris forgot about the other part of the uh, the people that are involved in this, and that's the public. And I hope that uh, when the time comes, because under our system, it's a consensus. No group, even Comin, can't claim to have a mandate to do anything. It's a consensus, and it's getting all our representatives to have that consensus. But I think when it's so big as this. It's essential that we, the constituents, and we, the people of the island, are consulted and have our ability to make our views known, as the people did over the prescription charges, for example. There was a great opposition to that, and thankfully it's gone back for a rethink. So I think, Chris, you've got to remember that it's not just you and the elected members, it's also the people of the island. Well, you, you heard that, Stephen. I, I'm sorry then, I just it was mass miscommunication on my part. I completely agree with you. But it's much more than just having a consultation. It's about consensus. If we are changing so fundamental, something so fundamental as how we organise health and care, it's got to be by consensus, and that involves much more than just one co communication and one consultation. It involves a process, just as you describe. The people are at the heart of it. Stephen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, and thank you, panel, for your answers. Cheers. Bye-bye. <coughs> that was Stephen. <coughs> now, yes, that reminds me, Chris, talking about uh, all the various issues and uh, building almost like a pyramid of issues there. Daphne, at election time, you said an interesting interesting statement. I think it was to do with, uh, a lot of it was to do <coughs> with negotiating and a positive future in post-Brexit. Mm. That was in your manifesto, if I recall. But you also said that we're teetering on a precipice. Do you still think that? I think there are massive, um, well, I was going to say, icebergs ahead of us that have to be negotiated through. These, the, the, uh, there seems to be this perfect storm at the minute. There's all the negotiations over Brexit. There's money val and how we're going to comply in the future with international agreements over tax and finance. And I think that the Isle of Man, I wouldn't say it's precipice. Maybe, maybe we're going a little bit over, but there's still a lot of pitfalls ahead without careful negotiation. Mm, right now, we've got another one here, <clears throat> funny enough, tied in with just what S Stephen was talking about, where he said, rather than review the hospital, why not an in-depth scrutiny of overall government spending to see if more could be freed up for our NHS? And that is the job of politicians every year in February at the budget time. It's the job of government from June through to January or so to prepare the budget. Yes, com completely agree that point. 
can Mr. Thomas <coughs> inform us of the actions that are open to Mr. Cornell Kelly if he finds that a department has acted incorrectly in pursuing its stated policy and responsibility? Yeah, what's the comeback? He can't, uh, he can't force government or any other public body to make a change, but it would be very unusual if a government or any other public body didn't actually act according to the independent ombudsman. So the, 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 that's, that, that's it in a nutshell. We've got a political context to this. And we've also got a legal context, and the reality is government can't be forced by the ombudsman, but I would, it seems to me it would be very doubtful and dubious if a government didn't ignore um, recommendations and conclusions from somebody like an ombudsman. How is it working with the ombudsman now? Well, he's only just started, no, no, and, I mean, and given the constraints, I don't know what he's doing, but it's not for him to report to me how he's doing. But uh, we've set him up, the public can email ombudsman at timwood.org.im they can get make contact with him it has to be in writing it can't just be over a phone call but it's, the system's there use it and then we'll all know we'll be in a better place because we know how it's working now charlie's not madly happy about this computer thing we've been talking about <clears throat> he says i wouldn't trust a database framework thingy further than i could throw the cabinet office but he says three cheers for the data protection officer it's nice to know that somebody's properly awake around here so in other words this this you've got a, a big task ahead chris there's this lurking suspicion all the time we have it's about communication it's about building a consensus building trust the information commissioner doesn't only look at government the information commissioner data protection officer as charlie called it looks at everybody um, massive issue for us massive issue for the private sector for third sectors oh and i was taught had a really good meeting last week with people from the food bank um, from housing matters you had a great program just before christmas about this roger and an issue for them is all to do with data protection how is it they take people's personal data to make the assessments and the evaluation yeah it's people's data it's precious people's data anybody doesn't want everybody else to know what, what's going on and what they've told people is going on great challenge government is up for it and i do hope that charlie can be reassured but of course that's an organization outside government which comes under data protection anyway doesn't yeah it? there are two thousand there are two thousand data controllers in the isle of man and every one of them has got a great challenge right well you talked about food banks but in our prosperous and caring society that's a title from some distant past but it's that economic growth <clears throat> talk about people's wages I'm s are we not surprised at the number of people who uh, I was to discover needed a food bank who are homeless um, and have all sorts of other issues of this nature in this society today? Yeah, one of uh, my ma mailbag in August suddenly started getting very full of people concerned about the holiday hunger aspect. Mm. Children who are on free school meals during term time who they, they, they don't have access to school dinners obviously during the holidays. And on top of that, parents on low incomes having to get new uniforms, new shoes, and there's a whole load of expense. And I think that's when the Food Bank and Housing Matters, they, Food Bank particularly experienced a big spike in demand towards the end of the summer. And it, it's of concern, I think, to, to everybody in government as to how we can address that, because there seems to be this, they call the twin track economy, where some people are doing quite nicely, thank you, and certain aspects of the economy and the jobs and various sectors are doing very well. But at a fundamental level, people haven't or can't see any social mobility or even access to basic sort of basic level of income and that is something i hope that the policy and reform minister would look at but it's a problem that's taxed the minds of countries throughout the world it's not a uniquely manx problem lab yeah and very much so yeah. and congratulations and thanks to the stakeholders who've organized themselves and have made representations to government which we've heard in good faith we want to break down this issue into manageable chunks so one level it's about making sure that pensions and benefits and wages are of sufficient um, size to be able to afford to live a normal life on the Isle of Man and I hope we've got po um, policies and programmes in place to deal with that. Secondly it's about looking at the benefit system to see whether we were causing undue stress to people by not making money available to them at the times when they need it. So for instance it's very expensive to move into a, a new place to live and perhaps we can help on with, with that. There are things like deposits for getting connected to the gas. We've got to look around policies for that. So I want to be very practical about how government can respond with very important structural Whichever issues. Whichever way you turn, you're talking about spending money. And, and, uh, and, and we have, government does spend a billion pounds. We do spend hundreds of thousands on Social Security um, each week. And... Um, so it's just a question of making sure it's spent properly because what we all want is we want the right people to not be struggling by and uh, you know that's, that part of that can be done with better government that's what we're trying to do 
Let's take a break. Radio. Welcome back to The Man in Line. With me in the studio is Daphne Kane, MHK for Gough, <coughs> and Chris Thomas, the Minister for Policy and Reform. And we've been talking about a number of the texts and emails that are coming here and in here and still are coming in, I'm pleased to say. But before that, we have another caller on the line, and it's Will. Good afternoon, Will. Wilford. Hi. Wilford, uh, I'd say. Just, just, yes, yeah, Wilford is. Uh, just a bit of useless information, if you like. Uh, something that everybody can sort of listen to and take in. How times have changed. Um, we're talking now about uh, marksmen shooting the goats on Bulgham Head. Right. I know two men, still about, who were birched in the old days for shooting a goat on Bulgham Head. Really? Yeah. yeah, a fellow goat, not somebody's property. And now we're talking about we got marksmen now to shoot them. Mm. Mm. Well, that's very, that's very interesting, Wilfred. I'm sure Daphne's yeah. got something to say on it. Well, it's like you said, how times change. And I'm just looking at the the um, DEFRA advice that went out over ten years. Um, I can only assume that was done without the permission of the landowner, because some of the landowners don't permit and don't welcome any any means to control the goats on their property. So perhaps that was somebody who'd who'd done it without the permission of the landowner. Mm. Right. <clears throat> but I think they actually did it uh, for something to eat. Yeah. <laughs> well, in those days, home yeah. to eat it. Yeah. Well, I, I know yeah. a couple of. Fellows got birch for the privilege of it. I know there are people who've been offering goat curry sauce of meat <laughs> around <laughs> in the, in recent months, but um, no, I think I think that the key thing for me is that the DEFRA advice that went out to lo- local people and commissioners in recent times said reducing the population to a manageable number in an attempt to restrict their range and reduce the herd's internal competition for resources and raise the general health standard appears to be the most sensible course. And I think that's that's what everybody wants, is that we want a, we want a healthy herd of wild goats. I've got a question for well, you, Wilfred. I've got I, uh, I, 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 I don't go with that. I think leave the goats alone. They do no harm to anybody. Well, okay. Well, the report, of course, is that they might be. The 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 reports I'm getting from certain farmers is that they are suspected of spreading disease. Certainly, this advice from DEFA from several years ago does support that, and that actually that there may be an animal welfare issues for the goats themselves. And I do notice that there's no mention in the program for government when the new animal welfare bill is going to come forward, or what that well, might. Well, I'd like in- to see. I'd like to see some proof of that, and I've never heard of any disease being spread in the past with them. Okay, well, well, that's fine. Of course, you talk about goats and food in Middle East countries and further. Goats are a staple diet, aren't they, in the food? So, exactly. Okay, well. All right, thank you for joining us, Wilf. Okay, Cheers. okay. Thank, thank you very Wilf. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, it's a done deal, then, on the health service privatisation, um, says our friend here, and it's not free at the point of need. If you, Well, it, it, there's always been different charges, hasn't there, for certain services, and you are trying to attract people to come here. You really can see how the NHS of the UK is in a meltdown due to the interference of private companies and management consultants. And as the previous caller said, is Mrs. Kane going to be able to speak? Well, I'm not <laughs> too sure why Mrs. Kane can't, didn't they? I remember him saying that. Well, I, I think it's because Chris obviously is the policy minister, so yeah. and many of the questions he has, he has a lot to say in reply that people will be interested in hearing. <laughs> and uh, I, I can answer the questions on the goats, but I hope, you know, perhaps uh, we might get a bigger variety in the next 15 minutes. Mr Thomas, the wages bill of the public services is the main billy goat in government and it far outweighs any other government costs and the biggest public issue is what are you going to do about it? Was that wages or pensions? Wages in this instance. Well let's just think about this in terms of the health service. 80% of the costs of health and care are public servants costs. That's how, that's uh, that, that's just true. So therefore we can't deal with the issues in health and care unless we make sure that we've got good uh, happy, effective staff in health and care, so we have to make sure that we're paying the right amount of money and we've got the right deferred wages in the form of pensions. Massive task sorting out public sector pensions. We can't do anything in isolation from what's going on around us. Now, Wilf also asked us a question similar to that. He says, <clears throat> when will the current situation in government dealing with the problem of public service pensions next be assessed and communicated to the public? I'm not sure which wolf this is, but... Um, Roger Tomlinson. Roger, you've, you've, you come to most Timwood sessions, so you will have heard that in February we made massive changes to gas. 
Later on, we made massive changes to the police. That was in December. I've announced that we're in uh, serious discussions with the teachers, judiciary. That is all about reforming the system as it is. Mm. That we, I've published the actuarial report in September about the positive uh, impact that's making on cash flow. We've got a large number, which is the actuarial li liability. A lot of that, if not most of that, is to do with the legacy, and I believe... In February or March, we'll have the legacy report uh, to Tim Wall, depending on uh, how, what, what Comin decides. Mm. The, this is just a comment, and that is that um, 88 million going out to retired government employees, 30 million to pay for current employees' contributions, tens of millions going on railways, but not enough money for a health service. A total disgrace, says our correspondent. But the point is that 80% of the cost of the health and care service are staff. Mm. Right. Now, <clears throat> let's see what else have we got coming in here now. Um, Kevin in Lax, he says that they didn't get birched, but uh, Wilfitt is, is actually for, for them. I, well, I wouldn't know whether they did or they didn't, but uh, at this stage now. Uh, <clears throat> Dee says, can anyone on your panel explain how the Chief Minister can say on Manx TV interview that Mrs Beecroft was very hard working in her role as Minister of Health and then he sacks her? At the same interview, he called of the mistakes made in the Vision 9 debacle, but doesn't utter so much as a rep reprimand, let alone demand that the minister resigns. I think this entire episode suggests the chief minister has never got over his dislike for Mrs Beecroft, and the jobs in his government is for his chums. That's, well, a, that's an impression people might have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, certainly from my point of view, having read the Vision 9 report, I don't think it was down to an individual person that should be blamed or be a scalp for the outcome of that report. I do think it was, as the report stated, a complete failure of the Council of Ministers. And I believe that the Chief Minister was also part of that Council of Ministers and on the Health um, Department, which was one of the contributing departments that couldn't see a way for the Vision 9 project to go ahead. Mm. <clears throat> but there's lots and lots of papers from the Vision 9 report that are held for members to see but the public aren't allowed to see them. Apparently. I, I haven't had a chance to go and see them yet. I, I've spoken to one or two who have and I will I will take up the opportunity to go and read some of them. But it's from from their report and the final recommendations the, the recommendations are very straight in terms of what needs to happen to make government work better but that's what we're told is happening with the programme for government and this new consensus government and it doesn't um, go down well with everybody. In terms of the the health minister's position, I think that was following discussions with the health members rather than just the chief minister making the decision alone. Good job I'm not in America because the person at the top, even if it wasn't his fault, has to resign, don't they? <clears throat> like, the, like the admiral who resigned because somebody bumped a ship in the Far East. You know, there is a there's a line of <coughs> responsibility somewhere, isn't there, in all this? With the financial difficulties in the health service, I see that on the island we have 19 community homes for approximately 100 clients. Would it not be more efficient to have fewer homes where there's a lower occupancy, with each requiring a full complement of staff, as it's understood to be the case at Jerby? In other words, they're only used by the sound of it, according to this. It's the old people's homes. Mm. Community homes. Community homes. Well, certainly residential nursing care, um, care in the community, integrated care, but uh, linking that with between health and care are all, again, massive challenges that we've got to face. 31st of January, 7.30pm, the Manx Legion is organising a, a, a presentation by officers to explain where we are. Politicians will be there to talk about options for the future, and then I invite that uh, person who sent you the message and anybody else to come along and continue the debate on the future of community care, residential care, nursing care, care more generally. Now we're going back to the single register or whatever you want to call it now. <clears throat> Andy says, uh, ask Chris how we go about not putting our names on the register. And before he says we cannot, of course we can, as we are governed by consent. So can you make sure this is area in the, is in the legislation that you're about to enact? Everybody already has to register to uh, to on the election register. It's just we haven't taken that action it's in the past. It's not compulsory, though, is it? It is compulsory to be on the electoral register. It's just we haven't taken action in the well. past and so on. So, um, and are you uh, going to take action in the future? I, 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 th I think uh, that's an important discussion to be had. And when we take when we bring the new electoral registration bill to two keys, which will probably be in within 12 months, these are the questions that you can raise definitely on the floor of House of Keys. 
Uh, of course, that takes us then to if they have to uh, obliged to be on the register, are they obliged to vote? In, in my personal opinion, no. Um, I think to be able to exercise your right not to vote, you ought to be forced to be on the register. But I hope that everybody will vote because it's massively important to take part in democracy and to determine the future of your health, education. As everybody said at the last election, if we had to vote, we need another bit on that says none of these. You know, in, in. Now, we've got four minutes left and we've got about five emails here, so can I just back through them as quick as we can? Regarding the people Birch for shooting feral goats, I doubt if they had large enough calibre to cleanly kill the animal, so maybe on cruelty grounds. There are only a minority of shooters on the island that have the high power calibre required to humanely cull. And it, and it will be an issue for the Animal Welfare Bill, which I expect yeah. within mm. two or three years. Yeah. Can Tindall Commissioner for Administration look at issues with governance in local authorities? Well, we touched on that. Not yet, but coming, is that it? Yeah, that's oh, right. Right, right, right. And <clears throat> paid Manx NI for 46 years, three months off recovering from an illness, £80 a week I got in benefits, £9.5 million in government sick pay. This is a bit of a joke. Well, they're different situations. Uh, national insurance is a collective system around society to provide benefits, pensions, health service. Uh, occupational pensions are, very, uh, are more generous in private sector, public sector. You know, fair point. That is a figure that we published in the <coughs> annual report for, by the PSC. Think about um, we the are case. Troubled. He's not too keen on learning about the systems. He just feels short -changed. Yeah, well, we are, we are troubled by the absenteeism and the um, health of public service workers as well. Maria called to say that she thinks the suggestion that they should shoot the goats is disgusting. Leave them alone. They're not doing anybody any harm. Well, we've been I think it's the, a matter of the numbers. Everybody would like a healthy goat population, the wild goats around Bulgham, but they are now stretching Laxey, Balarek and further north into Mackled. Mm. And Kelly <clears throat> says you can't force us to be part of your totalitarian regime, You're, so you are not my government. Well, I think we're into political philosophy here, but um, Anne makes a good point. I do hope that um, the Isle of Man government has the support of the people, and that's all about building consensus. I just hope that politicians can keep the faith of the public in democracy and in, in, in elections and in voting. That's what's going wrong in Ireland, in our island and also in the rest of the British Isles. People aren't voting and people aren't coming with their politicians. We used to, The first elections we had in the island, nearly 90% of people voted. It got down to 53% at the last election and we've got to do something about it. And this is <clears throat> internationally the year of the woman at the moment. Yet we still have this problem here, Daphne, that female members of the House of Keys are in a minority still. And the number of candidates, whilst increased, is still in a minority. I mean, we still have this inequality, which is not necessarily imposed either by the public or the system. No, it's put, it's by the numbers coming forward. I think the number elected was in proportion to the number coming forward. Perhaps if there was a greater look at the working hours of members, that might encourage more diversity coming in. And the the fact of having the um, Women's Day of Action and Unity, I think, is a great idea. And I should be going down to the promenade for the 3 p.m. start as well this afternoon. And I will to show support. <laughs> <laughs> right. now, now, interesting, a couple of other points have cropped up. We were talking about earlier on wages and you were talking about trying to make sure people get paid enough or they, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about minimum wage. What's happened with the living wage over here? The government's calculated the living wage. Um, if the p people want us to do it again, we could, but we're not doing it again unless uh, we're asked. Um, somebody outside government could uh, calculate it, as happens um, across. Ramsey and Castletown commissioners have announced a commitment to the living wage. Um, it was tweeted, uh, what was in the newspaper, I forget where I read it, but um, it, it is true uh, that I've invited Ramsey Town Commissioners to, to, to bring over the Living Wage Foundation to have a, a meeting and further discussions about what the living wage mechanism could look like, but it's got to be outside government. <clears throat> well, as we're going forward in this digital age, it's interesting, as a former final shot now, to say that <clears throat> the F Institute of Fiscal Studies has just warned that a rapid increase in the living wage could mean that more jobs are replaced by robots. Yeah, very much so. Um, we've, we've got an investigation of what Daphne called earlier the twin tack economy going on because uh, there are issues in the area of care, in the area of retailing, in the area of hospitality that we need to take uh, care of in terms of increasing costs to businesses and others <coughs> no. operating. Now, we're going to have to go because we're right at the end, but um, Sarah says there are far more important things to be discussed in government, like the underfunding of education, not federal goals. Get a grip and discuss the real issues of today. Well, Sarah, you have a point to make, I suppose, and 
funny enough, education was one of those that we just ran out of time. We haven't got round to. We live to do it another day. Thank you all for joining us. That's Chris Thomas, Minister for Policy and Reform, and Good Daphne Kane, who's the MHK for Gough. Catherine Nicholl was on the switch. I'm Roger Watterson. John Moss will be here next week, and I'll be back the week after. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>